So Christine is Head of Research and Innovation at Blue Chip Vision, and they produce and license, I love this term, a digital ecosystem of blockchain-based technologies, systems and platforms. So that's what you're going to talk about today. Uh, Christine has over 87 peer-reviewed publications, and you've helped define mobile and distributed spaces in terms of the sorts of interactions they generate in the light of cultural, social and political conditions in which they are deployed. So, welcome Christine. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Okay, so the name of this paper is The Dark Paper, Design Disruption and Dystopia in the Blockchain. And it is the dark paper as distinct from the white paper, which normally accompanies any, any offering in the tech space, especially in the um, blockchain space. So why did I call it the dark paper? It was about three in the morning and I was sitting there trying to, just racking my brains, trying to write the white paper for my company, Blue Chips Vision. And I was starting to think about how blockchain is sort of rolling out this whole new internet in the world and how vastly different it is from the internet that we currently know, our World Wide Web. You know, which is, it fails, it, dis, it disconnects all the time, it's hackable, it's, um, you know, it maps really well onto humans. It's kind of messy and kind of a bit random, just like, let's face it, we often are not the perfect robotic species that we might be. And I was then thinking about the qualities of blockchain, its immutable ledger, its concise ledgering, and its lack of ambiguity, and wondering, is this bringing about a whole new level of regimentation and precision that may not be so easily consolidated onto the randomness of human nature? So that, with that in mind, I started thinking about the more dystopian aspects of what could happen when blockchain technology gets rolled out, because it is, of course, very important that when we design technology, we think about what its impact on society will be, because we can't unmake it. Once it's embedded in society, you can't sort of extract it back out. So just a brief touching on what is Bitcoin. And the interesting thing is you can get a room full of people and they will all give you an analysis of what Bitcoin will be and they'll be vastly different from each other. They'll all probably be right. So there's many ways that you can think of it. But I basically think of it as um, the ideology. It sort of it produces a... It's a it's a currency, actually, with a philosophy. But um, it's a, it was developed in 2009 by the fictitious Satoshi Namanoto. And no one knows who this person to this day is, who it actually was that did write the white paper that gave birth to Bitcoin. And I love this mystery, this mystery about it. It gives it a very nice sort of cyberpunk feel. But it's a basically a decentralized, non-hierarchical currency, which not only revolutionizes the way that we use um, the way that money is exchanged, but it actually does call into question the very nature of how money is controlled in society. And it really did it did good work with that. And it came at a time in 2009 when technology at the time that was being rolled out was being characterised by concerns with organised and organised organisational efficiency, enhancing social mobility, and reducing programs to lightweight smartphone apps. So at this time, Bitcoin came on the scene and brought with it a truly transformative application for informing and infecting users' relationship with technology, its own embedded philosophy. Okay. Which is the next logical thing. Let me just move up these slides again. Sorry, I've got some. And now we're moving on to blockchain. Okay. So then, having, just, having now illuminated what Bitcoin is, what is blockchain? Blockchain is the underlying nervous system of Bitcoin, providing the network and it allows it the functionality to actually operate. And blockchain has a strong um, push towards um, decentralized spaces and it erodes the power held by financial institutions. And in this way, blockchain technology not only challenges the way in which capital flows, but it actually has the potential to sort of disrupt the capitalist system. And it, with this, don't forget, the philosophy behind this was born out of a time of the excesses of the financial institution in, at the late turn of the century. And people were quite disillusioned with the disparate power. And this was meant to put, pe put it back in the hands of people. It took out the process of a middleman and allowed people to just use the technology, the technology itself provided the trusted ledger that allowed a transaction to take place. And so by taking out the middleman and just making it a peer-to-peer -peer transaction, that was a fairly revolutionary thing. And of course, what's revolutionary about it is it's not just relevant for Bitcoin. It's relevant for many, many different things, and that's what we're starting to realise. So blockchain networks are transcending the financial sphere as everything from the Internet of Things to our digital identity is being mapped onto these growing, growingly decentralised networks, creating a new digital layer over the world. 
And if you think about it, it's a very different thing when you take what is something that is meant to just support a financial transaction and apply it to a whole range of everyday activities. We start to bring in a whole lot of new implications. And these implications have been largely sort of um, touched on. Um, and that's because blockchain is seen to be very revolutionary. Its networks are not only exploding in numbers, they're scaling up to become major digital entities. They're supporting and sustaining rapid technological and social change. And um, this revolutionary potential of blockchain models, it's garnered much attention. And I think in part because the blockchain story that it tells positions its technological affordances within this positive dialogue and it, this positive dialogue of it, of social transformation, that by you know engaging in this currency, you're actually engaging in a new space where people are, are much freer and they're not part of a, a system of hierarchy. And, it is a very big for the next generation. Bitcoin is seen to have a cultural currency that is so hard to achieve. You could never buy that type of cultural currency. It seems to be authentic. It seems to be real. It seems to be fair. And everything that's good about the world seems to be associated with it. And it's interesting to see it actually have all these values being piled upon it by a new emerging generation. But what are some of the key features of blockchain? Okay. Well, as I said, it's decentralized. It challenges the power, it challenges powers and hierarchies. That started off with banks, but as it's being applied into other fields, like a lot of people are pushing to have blockchain technology to support electronic um, governance and self-governance. And one of the ideas is that people could be truly democratic. They could vote on every single issue because blockchain technology would allow the people to speak and everyone would have their say, which is a very utopian ideal. Um, but it's also interesting that it's disruptive. It's a standalone technology. Most technologies come along and they build on pre-existing technologies in some way, shape or form to it to bring about a better way of doing something. Whereas blockchain technology is nearly across the board disruptive in that it has no relationship to what's pre-existing there. It's its own paradigm in itself. And that's all well and good, but for those of us that have just spent a fortune, you know, jigging up our smart, our smart home or things like that, blockchain's inability to link into any of our pre-existing devices is problematic. Um, the next thing about blockchain is it's immutable. And when I say immutable, it produces a trusted ledger that actually is a every transaction that's ever made is that produced for all time and anyone can see it's publicly available and it cannot be changed or altered and that's what gives that's what gives blockchain its trust and allows these huge transactions to take place like something like an 80 million dollar bitcoin transaction happened the other day and um, it happened in three seconds and there was like cost the person 30 cents so you can see it does have this efficient speed and efficiency and anonymous, which brings me to the last key feature of a blockchain. Not at all. Bitcoin is not anonymous. And it's a huge myth that Bitcoin is anonymous. And it's perpetuated by the media who keep associating it with some of its um, early applications in the Silk Road and, and the, dark, the dark web and things like that. And it's interesting that this myth is perpetuated because anything that produces a ledger with an account of every single point in which that Bitcoin has gone and been sold or traded or bought and is associated with the identity of the person that bought the Bitcoin, which is increasingly becoming how one has to purchase Bitcoins, it would have to be the absolute opposite to anonymity. And so I always wonder and marvel at the way in which blockchain is and Bitcoin is always thought to be this anonymous currency used for dodgy activities when really nothing could be a worse currency for a dodgy activity than something that's going to have a ledger of every single place that currency has gone and been. So I don't know why this persists as this very interesting urban myth about blockchain. Um, okay, okay. So having look, talked about its um, sort of its uh, you know potential let's focus on the nitty-gritty of the dystopian perspectives because bitcoin's ideology is actually it really comes from a desire a genuine desire to make the world a better place but for those developing and deploying blockchain systems it's helpful to think about what might happen if this self-automating technology and its utopian ideology were to decouple so it's all very good you've got this hugely efficient platform running this application that is meant to bring good to people and meant to make our society a fairer place. But what happens if you lose the Bitcoin part of it, the, the feel good, the do good part of it, and you're just left with the cool efficiency automation of blockchain? Well, that's what um, we're going to talk about next. So as I mentioned earlier, there's this myth of the decentralized state that blockchain is going to bring about social and political change, allowing citizens to be self-governing. Every issue that is coming up can be governed on by everyone. People can vote 
in the moment on the fly about every single issue. And I love the fact that it does have this democratic ideal attached to it. Um, although how for that to happen, of course, blockchain is then just as it started to erode the financial institutions, if it starts eroding all the, the, the laws of governance and the things that we actually fail, a lot of people in the crypto anarchy space, which is a huge part of blockchain, um, fail to kind of recognise this, is that we have things such as our right to privacy. Things like this are really important to us and we don't want to just be dismantling all the structures because what is left, probably what is left is not this utopian self-governing space, but McDonald's coming in and turning us all into a McWorld or something like that. So I think this, the whole vision that they have is perhaps one that's not that realistic. And this is a great quote though about, it's very hard to find anything that does critique blockchain, but I thought this quote was good. We don't want a dystopian future in which corporations and not democratically elected governments call the shots. We don't want international order akin to post-democracy or post-law. While the nation state remains a bundle of class contradictions, it's still to this point the most powerful mechanism the world has seen for achieving social rights. And so that, keeping that in mind, these are the sort of things that we don't want to be using blockchain necessarily to try and dismantle, things that give us the social rights that we have now. So the next dystopian aspect of blockchain, which is very rarely discussed, is uneven access. And the notion of uneven access is, of course, is well been documented by Castells, who uh, talked about the digital divide in terms of who has access to the internet, the information it provides, and who doesn't. But um, as a great quote from Castell, despite its potential to bestow great benefits to humanity, technology's big problem is its uneven access. But with blockchain, we have a whole other problem. Not only have we got the uneven access, which is particularly uneven, because if anyone's ever tried to buy Bitcoin, it's actually quite complicated, and the whole process is just convoluted and difficult. But we also have, as Adam Greenfield, the famous science fiction futurist author said, um, the, he's, uh, what did he say? Um, in his book, Radical Technologies, he said that blockchain is just fundamentally difficult for otherwise intelligent and highly capa pe capable people to understand. And that is, that is really true. Is anyone here that feels that they don't really understand blockchain and Bitcoin in a thorough and in-depth manner? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> So that's interesting. It really, and you probably have one of the finest group of minds here you could have. And so there we go. <laughs> it's nice. And um, Greenfield went on to say that um, uh, yeah, so uh, when critiquing, so I'll go back one second. Okay, so the next thing that, um, the, the next issue that we have is with the notion of automation. Blockchain removes the human from the equation and a transaction happens just from technology to technology, like two bots can do it. So what happens when you actually this automation provides a high level of efficiency, a high level of trust, and that's fantastic. But um, you know, in just under 10 years, blockchain's been able to create a whole new internet. As I mentioned earlier, it's vastly different to the World Wide Web with its fails, its disconnects, and its hackability. I mean, this new internet is concise. It's got this concise ledger. It's regimented. It's precision. There's no ambiguity. The, and this automation that works so well with financial transactions, when applied to other activities in everyday life, this coupling may not be so smooth. So if we think about the like, ap applying automation, for example, to law enforcement, or applying automation to so many things where there is a need for human input and our understanding of the nuances of everyday life. This, all this will be coolly removed. This is the vision of a society that is based on this whole new web. And it's, it's really quite frightening, actually, to some degree, that so little critical thought has been put into what happens when you do automate a whole process. And just like the web allows you know, things to be redone, it allows you to re do over things. Once something is entered on this ledger, it can never be undone. So there's no real allowance for what happens when misinformation is put in there. And so if you're unlucky enough, and digital identity is one of the biggest blockchain applications there are. And so if you think your digital identity is put and uploaded into the blockchain with incorrect information that in some way, you know, is not flattering to yours, you know, it really has scary implications and that's something that I think we need to carefully consider. And again, Grim, the same author said, when critiquing the complex roles that technology plays in shaping the political state, um, Greenfield said, I believe the distributed ledger enables the kind of central control they've never thought of in their worst nightmares. And he was just again talking about the, the, problem, the problematic nature of trying to deal with this immutability that can never be changed, it can never be altered, and once it's automated, the human, there is no human interaction in this whole function. So that's sort of an interesting space that we're heading towards. Bear with me for one sec. Okay. 
So what is the solution here? So that's a really quite a clear solution, I think, and that is to integrate centralised and decentralised elements together when we design these technologies. And I think the dystopian perspective helped highlight the vulnerability, the social, cultural and political vulnerability of a truly centralised and automated system. And technology can either push this divide or it can bring the possibility of more of, more of an incorporated blockchain to us, and I think the future is bright if we combine the both together. And that's what that's what we've been trying to do with our research, which is to try and see how we can possibly bring in um, bring these forces together. Because we don't want to design systems based on solely on what is achievable. Just design it because we can. It's much better if we can design things that will actually really think forward future into how it will impact on our lives. And I, for example, we have a system rhizomic, which is its primary function is connecting real world assets to the blockchain. And it does this by allowing users to create their own digital tokens, which they can attach a value and put across the blockchain. And they can then issue, share, track or trade digitally represented assets and services. But by doing this, we've provided a portal between centralised and decentralised environments. And but we've simultaneously integrated and incorporated into the blockchain elements such as governments and legislation. So we've tried to bring that into the blockchain system. So we're starting to have a system that's evolving with the best of both worlds. And we also have a, another platform called ICO Mint, which allows users to create their own digital currency. But it's all the all the necessary compliance regulation of the person's particular country, what their industry is, what type of investor they are, that is all embedded in the system. So you can only produce a legal currency based on whereabouts in the world you are. So the idea is to try and see how legislation and compliance can work with blockchain, even though traditionally it kind of pushes those things away. And it's actually working quite well. It sort of automates it for us. So that's a sort of a good thing. But we've basically, I think that the thing to keep here is that we're actually better together. Blockchain has so many different um, efficiencies that it can lend the everyday world. It has tr provides trust, it applies efficiency, it has the speed and speed and mechanics to make like fiat currency or regular currency just flow smoothly. And this can be applied to anything. So I think the, as long as we can harness it well, it's going to be a wonderful addition. But in conclusion, I will just say that Blockchain technology does not in, exist in a self-contained cryptocurrency bubble, which is what people in blockchain technology like to think it does exist in. So this is the talk that people don't generally be, would not be saying the things I'm saying now. So the challenge, of course, is then to integrate it in a way that actually supports the reality of the everyday human experience. And as much as we might like to think that the everyday human experience is one of cool efficiency and it's in many cases, not quite the case. We need to look at the bumbling human, understand it for what the bumbling human can be. Their, their attempts to integrate with current technologies, current platforms, all those things are an important part of the reality of the situation. And I think the ability to link into that is going to be really important. And I'll just finish off with this quote by Donna Haraway because I think that really does sum things up beautifully. She's a legendary cyber theorist. Technology is not neutral. We're inside of what we make and it's inside of us. We're living in a world of connections and it matters which ones get made and which ones get unmade. And I think that is the key, is to think critically about which ones get made and what gets unmade. And so on that note, thank you so much for having me. And does anyone have any questions? Uh, I'll have one. Christine, would, Lovely. You, would you like to um, posit what you might think would be the defence applications of uh, this type of technology? Well, def see, defence seems to me to be one of the applications that blockchain is so particularly well suited towards. And, you know, I don't want to be so forward as to say, but I can't help but think, you know, when you have things that just seem really wrong for blockchain, and then you have things that seem really right. And to me, blockchain and defence are so perfectly suited because they both need the cool efficiency, they both need the precision, they both need the, the, trust, that, the, the trust that it provides. And the ability to be able to track and trace, like, whether it's people like in real time on the ground and have an account of that that's shared, whether it's, I'm not, it's such an exciting, exciting area and I think a very, very natural, um, a very natural combination. But I really think what it, it does give you is an account of what's going on that can be easily managed in real time that would be really beneficial. And you don't need necessarily in the warfare situation to have a human element. The automation is possibly something that could be highly beneficial. Great. So, Christine, will you be staying with us today? So yes. People, so that's great. So people can okay, come Absolutely. Come but before you go, Christine, I've... Yes. Sorry, Ooh. sorry, boss. Yeah. 
Oh. <laughs> so I get to do the I get to do the fun bits. So oh, thank thanks, you so Christine. Very much. But uh, this is a little small memento uh, of the syndicate, and so like in defence, we'd like to give out coins. Or it's not real money, but well, it's a, from a it's, block. I love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Blockchain. That's right. Yeah, it's our Bitcoin. It's um, beautiful. But uh, wow, thank you. A beautiful, real, tangible yeah. artifact. Thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> <laughs> but just to say, but I think that actually you you are right. There is some potential, I think, around. Uh, uh, blockchain uh, for uh, defence, particularly uh, the traceability of decision making and uh, how decisions were made, and uh, because quite often in the fog of war, you know what actually transpired, and also the authorities that are passed down to people to be able to act. So this is actually quite an interesting thing, and I think you're onto something with the Rizomic, with the is Rizomic, yeah, yeah. Yeah, is the the idea of some sort of centralisation because we can't have a decentralised Australian Defence Force. Uh, it has to have while well, it's got will have governance through these decentralised mechanisms. You do need some centralisation and control and in the end it's all about people so but I think you're on to good things and I think this is a may actually stimulate a lot of discussion oh, so uh, and uh, potential uh, to do work together so oh, thank well, you so thank much you so good luck with your work thank, thank you, you.